Okay, well, welcome. Thank you all for joining us and um, thank you uh, for joining us online. I had a look at the registration um, list and we've got a very distinguished group in the room and online um, and we're delighted to have you all. My name is Christine Haight Farley and I'm a professor here. I teach um, intellectual property law courses. I'm teaching a, a course to 1Ls right now. I'm looking at some of the 1Ls in the room. Um, and we at our program um, on information justice and intellectual property law have been running now for more than a decade, this series where we invite um, the litigants, amicus brief authors and other experts to come and join us at the law school at five o'clock. Um, could someone, could one of you shut the door? <laughs> um, to join us at five o'clock on the day of oral argument whenever there is an IP case being argued at the court. Um, we've expanded that to IP and technology. We're, we're willing to open this up a little more. And we've had great fun from the beginning with the series. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, think about the case um, as soon as we get the first insights on it, which we may get some insight from, uh, from the oral argument. Um, so, of course, today is a copyright case and we're here. Um, so what I'm going to do in the interest of time, we have just one hour with these wonderful experts to talk about the case. Um, I want to let you know that we have um, a handout and online um, the bios of our wonderful, wonderful speakers. So I'm not going to take the time to read their full bios, um, but I want to let you know that um, between our speakers online and in the room, we have uh, three rock star IP litigators, and I'm really delighted um, that they're here joining us. Um, so we have um, online, uh, we have Edward Rosenthal, who is a partner at Frankfurt Current Klein and Sells, um, and he filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Association of, Ameri of American Publishers in support of the petitioner. Uh, we also have uh, here on, uh, on the end, Scott Burroughs, who is a partner at Doniger Burroughs, and he filed an amicus brief on behalf of the National Society of Entertainment uh, and Arts Lawyers in support of respondent. Um, we also have, um, as, as another rock star attorney here, um, Kevin Fee, who's a partner at DLA Piper, um, and he's an interested onlooker, but has not committed to a position on paper, so I'm interested to hear his views. Um, and uh, then we have um, Jason Sloan, who is an assistant general counsel at the U.S. Copyright Office, and the government uh, filed a brief supporting respondent in the case. I'm also delighted to be joined by Professor Tyler Ochoa, who's joining us online. Um, and he is an IP professor um, at Santa Clara University School of Law. And he filed an amicus brief um, in support on behalf of himself, um, in support of neither party. Um, so uh, with that, I'm gonna come back to these speakers in a minute, but we always in this event get a wonderful mix of people who are absolutely expert on the nitty gritty issues that are brought up in this case. And we also get um, interested others. And, and I think my first year students are not, are, are a little bit more advanced than, than novices, but um, just so that we're all on the same page, I wanna give you some background of where the case came from and some of the things that I expect you're gonna hear about as we talk about this. So the petitioners in the case are Warner Chapel Music, um, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Warner Music Group um, and Artist Publishing Group. And I may um, collapse them all into Warner for um, purposes of speed. And respondents in the case are Music Specialist and its owner, Sherman Neely. So Music Specialist re uh, released sound recordings of a number of musical compositions in the mid 1980s. And five of those songs are at issue in the case now. Working with Neely, Tony Butler either wrote or co-wrote um, all five of the songs at issue. Um, so there is still 
a lingering issue of ownership of the copyrights of the songs involved in this case. Music Specialist dissolved in 1986 and was reinstated in 2017. Um, in 2018, while Neely happened to be in jail, Butler licensed uh, one song, Jam in the Box, and another song, In the Air, to Atlantic, which then licensed um, the music to rapper Flo Rida to make a recording. In the air, a air, air, a air, air. Uh, became a massive hit. You can see why. It's my rendition there. Um, Butler licensed artist publishing and in turn Warner to publisher to publish and administer Butler's entire catalog, including the works at issue. Uh, Neely claims that he was not informed of this alleged infringement until some point just shy of the three years um, where he filed the lawsuit. Um, he sued for infringement going back 10 years, however, um, before filing the suit. And in the case, I understand that the vast bulk of the damages would be in that previous seven years, so not within the three-year period. Um, so this is a case that involves the statute of limitations in copyright. Um, and just again, to, to um, kind of keep this present, the policy justification for a statute of limitations is to attempt to give some balance to uh, giving claimants adequate time to sue um, and giving de defendants repose and ensuring the thing that I need from upstairs. Uh, Oops. <laughs> um, um, and ensuring that there's reliable evidence in litigation. Um, so the Copyright Act has a statute of limitations provision in section 507B, and it says no civil action shall be maintained under the provisions of this title unless it is commenced within three years after the claim accrued. And so that word accrued um, could be construed in, in several ways, um, and it is not defined. In the case below, the district court um, considered the case to be timely filed because it was filed three years from when the injury was discovered, um, but limited the damages to that three-year period, didn't allow for recovery going back all 10 years. Um, in an interlocutory appeal, the 11th Circuit reversed and held that the discovery rule permits a plaintiff to recover all of the available damages. So this is a case that is focused on, or maybe uh, is focused on the discovery rule. We'll talk more about that. Um, the discovery rule says that a statute of limitations period starts when the plaintiff discovers or with due diligence should have discovered the injury. The alternative to the discovery rule is um, the incident of injury rule or the in injury rule, which starts the clock when the injury occurs. So the question is, does it start when the plaintiff finds out about the injury or when the defendant commits the act? Um, 11 of 13 circuits, and I understand that's every circuit to have considered it, has adopted the discovery rule. Um, the Supreme Court, however, has never ruled on the discovery rule. You will probably hear reference in the discussion today to a Supreme Court case from 2014 called Petrella versus Metro Golden uh, Meyer, which was also a statute of limitations uh, copyright case. In that case, the court held that because there is a statute of limitations in the Copyright Act, that the defendant um, uh, that um, the statute of limitations already takes account of delay and the defense of latches cannot be applied. The equitable defense of latches cannot be applied. Um, and that case did not decide the questions um, at issue in this case. Um, so the question presented in the case to the Supreme Court, and I wanna note carefully that the question presented was rephrased by the Supreme Court is, whether under the discovery accrual rule applied by the circuit courts and the Copyright Act statute of limitations for civil actions, 
Section 507B, a copyright plaintiff can recover damages for acts that allegedly occurred more than three years before the filing of the lawsuit. So again, the court says, under the discovery rule, can damages be recovered for more than three, the three years stated in the Copyright Act? Um, oral arguments were heard this morning, and um, I want now to uh, try not to steal anybody's thunder about what you, what you want to talk about with the case and just to give the background. Um, and so now I would like to um, invite my panelists um, to talk about um, for the first question I'll ask is um, why you you filed the brief in the case and um, if you could give us the executive summary of what the brief uh, says and I will start with you, Scott. Oh, thank you very much, Professor, and thank you for having me. I submitted a brief on behalf of the National Society of Entertainment and Arts Lawyers. In our organization, we advocate for creators in enforcing their rights because in a lot of the cases that you may have read or that you'll come across in practice, the creator may not have the same litigation war chest that a, a large studio or label may have. And because of that, creators oftentimes are at a disadvantage when litigating some of these very important and, and complicated copyright issues. In this, in this case, we filed a brief because there was an issue that is extremely important and germane to artists, particularly artists who are trying to bring a claim in court. And that is damages that are available. It's extremely expensive to litigate a federal court case. And to the extent that damages are limited, every time that happens or every time a court decision is made that makes it more expensive to litigate, more artists are going to be unable to proceed with their, their claims in court. And so on this issue of, of damages and, and how they're available, 507, Section 507 of the Copyright Act sets a statute of limitations, the date by which you must bring your case. But a different section, Section 504, sets forth damages, what you're uh, able to recover if you prevail in a copyright case. And what it says, and I'll paraphrase, is that you can recover your actual damages and the profits made by the infringer. The argument that, and it's a bit complicated, and we'll get into this because it's extremely important, and it's something as a court watcher that I haven't seen on this level before, but there were, there's a question before the court, and then there was a question that Sony, the label, tried to, I'm sorry, Warner Chappelle tried to, to present to the court. And that, I think, has an important lesson, which is listen to the court. Essentially, there is one case in the Second Circuit called Song that says that notwithstanding the fact that 504, which deals with damages, and 507, which deals with the statute of limitations, are different sections, there is a, a limitation on your availability or on the availability of damages that's temporal. So even if you file a claim within three years of discovering it, which complies with the statute, you're only able to recover three years of damages, which is often unfair because the infringement may have been going on for 10 years. And what 507 says is as long as you file within three years of discovering it, the infringer shouldn't be able to keep any of those profits. You should be able to go back and disgorge those profits. The question presented, or the way that the court reframed it, was assume that the discovery rule applies. Assume that it applies, and let's talk about whether or not this temporal bar, this three-year limitation, is right or wrong. There was a, a circuit split over it. All the other circuits had said, this temporal bar doesn't exist. Judge Sullivan and the Second Circuit panel said, said that it did. Structurally, a problem when Warner Chappelle argued this morning uh, was that the attorney uh, attempted to tell the court what the question was, and the court really pushed back on that. I just want to hold, well, oh. hold discussion of the argument, and okay. just, I want you just to talk about your brief. Okay, okay. and so the, the brief that we submitted talked about some of the issues that I, I just mentioned, that the, the um, statute of limitations and the damages statute, th that language exists independent of one another. There is no temporal bar. And if there is, it's going to be a real problem for artists and the attorneys that represent them because it's going to force more of them to simply waive their claims and not enforce their rights because it's, it's going to be too expensive and the damages available won't justify or cover the cost of litigation. Thank you very much. So I, I, I kind of went out of order of art. I went out of order of argument this morning. Um, so that's the that's um, in in support of respondent. Um, I'm going to go now to in support of petitioner. 
Um, Ned, can you tell us who you um, represented and why they thought it was important to file this brief and, and again, what in short the brief uh, says? Sure. So we filed an amicus brief on behalf of the Amer Association of American Publishers, which represents book and magazine and educational publishers in the United States. Um, I should add, though, that me and my colleagues at Frankfurt Carnet litigated the underlying Second Circuit case, some versus Scholastic on behalf of Scholastic. So this was an issue that's been in my mind for a long time. Basically in our brief, what we argued was that first of all, we noted that, that um, for publishers, th these cases are very difficult because like any case involving a statute of limitations, it's very problematic when you have to go back five, 10, 15, 20 years and try to find um, documents and witnesses and evidence to support your defense to a claim, whether it's the existence of a license or it's uh, costs for, which would be used to reduce a, a damage claim. Um, we, our basic position was that the court should apply the injury rule, not the discovery rule. Um, as amicus, I think we were a little bit freer to um, kind of go off the, uh, the, the question that the Supreme Court had, had asked the parties to address. And we said, but we said, said, if you're going to apply the discovery rule, then Judge Sullivan's decision in Soam versus Scholastic, which limited damages to three years, is consistent with the statements, dicta, or holding of Petrella, which said you can only you know, recover for uh, three years, going back three years. And it's a position that kind of hits a, a good balance between the rights of the creators and the rights of the users. Great, thank you. Okay, so I would like to turn to you, Kevin, um, who, as I mentioned, you're you're free to uh, speak off the cuff since you're, you're not on, on the record, yeah. um, but you've had a chance to follow the case and think about these issues. And we've heard now two arguments, um, kind of policy reasons why the court should um, narrow the, the limit or extend the limit. What, what your thoughts are coming out of, from a perspective of litigating these kinds of cases. Yeah, so since I'm not representing any party in connection with this matter, I am sort of free to speak off the cuff a little bit. And I do represent plaintiffs and defendants, so I really don't have a vested interest in this shaking out one way or the other for a particular client. My only real interest is I want to know how to apply to statute of limitations in copyright cases. Um, and Ideally, the way we would apply to statute of limitations would make sense from a policy perspective and be consistent with the statute. And uh, that's what I was hoping would come out of this uh, the case today. And I sort of agree a little bit with parts of the respondents and parts of the petitioner's argument. I, if we were going to get into whether or not there is a discovery rule built into the Copyright Act, I just don't see that that's in the Copyright Act. The Copyright Act says that the statute of limitations starts when the claim accrues. And the Supreme Court has made clear that a cruise that is not generally understood to mean a discovery rule. And the common understanding of the root rule word a cruise, I think to me, means when you're able to bring a claim, not when you discover it. Um, so looking at the text of the Copyright Act, I don't think there is a basis for a, uh, a discovery rule. But having said that, if there is a discovery rule, I don't understand how there's an argument that there's a limitation on the damages under that circumstance. The if the claim is timely, Section 504 governs what remedies are available, including damages, and it does not provide any basis for limiting those damages for timely filed claims. But at the end of the day, I just want to know what the rule is so we could practice uh, you know, without this uncertainty hanging over our heads. Great. OK, wonderful. All right, I think I'm going to go um, now to the professor, uh, uh, Tyler. Um, as I said, you filed a brief in support of neither party. Um, this is this case raises an issue that you've been looking at for a while. Um, you've written other briefs. Um, you've addressed this in your writing. So why don't you uh, let us know what you told the court in your brief? So the reason I filed a brief in support of neither party is because both parties are half right and half wrong. Uh, if one assumes that a discovery rule applies, uh, it operates in the way that the Ninth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit has found. And the Second Circuit's opinion in Soam versus Scholastic was, frankly, nonsensical. Um, 
the only basis that they had for saying there was a limitation on damages was the Petrella decision of the Supreme Court back in 2016. And they tried to harmonize the language of Petrella, uh, which said, you know, you're limited to three years worth of damages. But Petrella had nothing to do with the discovery rule. And this, what the Second Circuit said was that the three-year look-back period on damages was somehow disassociated with the, dis with the statute of limitations, which is completely incorrect. Right, the three-year look-back period in Petrella was expressly based on the three-year statute of limitations in Section 507B. So when the Second Circuit made its decision back in 2020, I immediately wrote a blog post about it saying this is completely wrong. Uh, and when the same issue came up in the Ninth Circuit, I wrote an amicus brief in the Ninth Circuit saying that the Second Circuit was completely wrong. So now we have a circuit split, which is the reason that the Supreme Court granted cert. But once you've granted cert on what happens under the discovery rule, there's an antecedent question, which is, does the discovery rule even apply in this case? Now, there's no circuit split on that. There are 11 circuits that say, yes, we use the discovery rule. Uh, no circuit that has gone the other way. So there's no real circuit split on the issue of whether the discovery rule applies. What there is is a split between the circuits and several of the conservative justices on the court who have made a crusade against the discovery rule. Uh, and their position is that the word accrued means that a cause of action accrues when you can sue and that there's no room for interpreting the word accrued to mean that the discovery rule applies as a rule of accrual. Okay, but that's, you know, since the 1980s, courts have gradually been moving in favor of a rule that said the discovery rule is the default rule of accrual. Justice Ginsburg, when she sat on the DC circuit, wrote that the discovery rule of accrual was the default rule of accrual in federal courts. Um, at the Supreme Court level, uh, they've never adopted that position. So what happens is if you've got 11 circuits that have all said, well, discovery rule of accrual is the default rule of accrual. We're going to use it for copyright cases. And you've got a Supreme Court that's never said the discovery rule is the default rule of accrual. And in recent years, several opinions in the Supreme Court have cast doubt upon that, starting with a concurring opinion by Justice Scalia, who called the discovery rule a bad wine of recent vintage as, as a default rule. Uh, Justice Thomas repeats that language in his majority opinion for in the Rotkiski case. So if it, to me, it doesn't make any sense to resolve, well, what's the effect of the discovery rule without asking the antecedent question? Does the discovery rule apply here at all? And on that question, I refer the court back to a district court case called Ouscape versus National Geographic, International, um, National Geographic Society. And Justice Kaplan or Judge Kaplan of the Southern District of New York wrote a very scholarly opinion looking at all the legislative history of the 1957 amendment that adopted the statute of limitation. And he came to the conclusion that Congress did not intend for the discovery rule to apply. Now, as a matter of policy, I can I understand arguments both ways, uh, but I'm just trying to get the law right here. And the reason I wrote a brief was that I'm probably the only copyright professor in the country who's also published articles on statutes of limitations as a scholarly endeavor. Um, so I've studied both areas and I thought it might be, I thought what I wanted to do was to tell the court, okay, if you're going to decide the, the discovery rule applies, this is the way to go. If you're going to look at the antecedent question, this is the way to go. Great. Thank, thank you, Tyler. All right. So now um, the government um, submitted a brief in the case and asked for time to argue and, and did present argument this morning. So can you um, tell us, um, uh, well, why don't you tell us what, uh, what the government argued or what the, what the government argued in its brief? Yeah, so sure. Just to back up for a sec for those who might not know. So the government participates through um, the solicitor's office in the Department of Justice. And when it's a copyright case, the Copyright Office, which is the federal agency that is tasked with administering the Copyright Act, is, is heavily involved in that process. Um, 
And so the government typically files a brief in copyright cases because the government has a significant interest in the national copyright system. And by statute, the Copyright Office is tasked with advising Congress and the courts on copyright. And this, in this particular case, we also um, administer um, a new small claims tribunal called the Small Claims um, Copyright Claims Board, um, which has a statute of limitations provision that is the same as 507B that was enacted only a couple of years ago. So we have an interest in um, understanding the interpretation um, of that statute. So um, yeah, so in the government's brief, um, we did not take a position outside of the question presented that was reformulated by the court. We took no position on the underlying question of the discovery rule because the question presented baked in an assumption um, about it. And our position is that it, um, it would not be appropriate for the court to, to reach that issue here because um, of the way the question presented was reformulated. On the actual question, we agree with the Ninth and Eleventh Circuit that if there's a discovery rule, there is no time bar on damages if the claim is timely. Um, we think the Second Circuit was wrong and that the court could resolve that split and that it's not necessary to address the underlying uh, issue to do that. Um, you know, there, there, there's precedent that the, the word accrue needs to be interpreted in light of the relevant statute, and it doesn't um, inherently mean uh, one thing or another. And uh, in Petrala, they, uh, the court recognized two potential options, the, the injury rule and the discovery rule are both interpretations of the word accrue. Um, but the point is that either way, if a claim is timely under 507B, then there's nothing else in the Copyright Act that imposes an additional uh, time bar that limits the recovery of damages to the last three years. You can argue about when a claim accrues, and that's that's the issue beyond the question presented. But if it's timely, um, there's no further limitation. 507B limits um, claims, not remedies, and that's where the, the the temporal limitation is. 504, which governs the remedies, doesn't impose any time bar that permits a successful plaintiff to recover actual damages plus any profits, or they can, um, if they're eligible, they can collect statutory damages for all infringements in the action. So, given the text of 507B and 504, the government's of the view that you know any sort of uh, judge-made rule that would limit damages in a timely suit would contradict the statute. Um, and then um, we, we also, uh, a, a decent amount of our brief is also devoted to explaining why we don't think Petrala uh, compels a contrary uh, result, but I know we wanna get to the oral argument discussion, so. Yeah, the oral <laughs> argument discussion. Um, the oral argument was very interesting today. So I, I, I have a preliminary question to um, our discussion of the oral argument. So we've mentioned that um, the Supreme Court reformulated the question presented. And I wonder if anyone has any insights as to how often that happens. Um, could, can anyone talk about just that move right there of taking um, the question presented by the petitioner and reformulating it at all, just the act of doing it. Anyone, Tyler, do you know anything about this? Um, I couldn't say how often it happens. Uh, I have seen it done before uh, where the Supreme Court doesn't wanna take a big broad look at something and just wants to focus on a narrower aspect of the case. Um, I, you know, it's cert I would say it probably happens, um, you know, single digits, every term, right? So, you know, it's not so rare that it doesn't come up very often. I'm sure it happens in some cases every term, but not very many, not that often. Um, so I haven't I haven't noticed it, not, not that that means I'm paying attention to all Supreme Court cases, but I have certainly noticed the opposite of that. Um, so I've certainly noticed that in a number of intellectual property law cases, the Supreme Court takes quite a broad question presented and then addresses a very narrow sub-question of that, um, or maybe even a different question. So for instance, in the Andy Warhol case, um, the question presented was whether a work of art is transformative. And the answer was a commercial license is not a fair use. <laughs> That's a, not even a sub question, right? That's just a totally different, <laughs> that's just a totally different case. So I just wanted just to pause on the fact that they did take this thing, which I think is to be applauded, um, certainly as compared to the alternative of just changing the case um, mid, mid flow. Um, and that 
allows the parties to brief the question presented, right? Um, if the question presented um, assumes that there's going to be a discovery rule, it allows the parties to direct or allows all of the um, amicus brief uh, um, authors and parties to address their briefing to that. So then we get to the Supreme Court argument this morning and it's, it's thrown up in the air, this question, right? Um, is the discovery rule on the table or not? Um, if it's not on the table, then does it make sense to decide this case? Um, was that, is that a fair <laughs> um, quick summary of, of the kind of range of questions we had? Um, uh, Ned, why don't, I, why don't I start with you and ask, um, what do you, what are your main takeaways from the argument this morning? So, so, you know, I think it's interesting, like I'm not a big Supreme Court expert, so I'm not even close to that. So um, I, I can't really opine on how often this happens, but I think we look at the Supreme Court sometimes as if it, every decision it makes is very carefully thought out and, and makes sense. And I think what happened today is that as the court progressed, probably well before the argument today, it kind of began to realize that the question presented didn't really work here and that the underlying question of whether the discovery rule or the injury rule applies is absolutely critical to this decision and this discussion. So um, I'm, you know, I, I think as an observer, we were quite surprised the Supreme Court took this particular case, um, which, and, and then even more surprised at the way they changed the question presented. Um, as the court noted during the argument today, there's another case that's where cert's been applied for called Martinelli, I think it's versus Hearst, Hearst Corporation, which much more squarely presents the discovery versus injury rule. And the court kind of said, you know, several of the justices said, well, shouldn't really we decide that first? I don't know where they come out on that, but I think it'll be interesting to see if they punt on this one. Yeah, well, I think the unorthodox nature of the oral argument started with the briefing, because generally speaking, when you have the Supreme Court um, addressing a circuit split, or each party who has a circuit on their side is going to extol why their circuit is right. But here in appellate's brief, and then particularly in the reply brief, they didn't mention SOM or the Second Circuit's decision, the one circuit that supported them, basically at all. They sort of abandoned the, the circuit split, which was why the Supreme Court took the case up in the first place. So when we got to oral argument today, the briefs that the, uh, the justices reviewed didn't speak to the circuit split. And the conversation uh, for that reason veered in a sort of bizarre direction. <laughs> question I had is how, I didn't think it was super clear that the discovery rule was absolutely off the table. Like Jason, I'm curious, the government decided not to address that issue, but it, and obviously it did benefit the Solicitor General's office who's much more familiar with the Supreme Court than I am. How obvious was it to everybody there that you're not talking about the discovery rule versus the injury rule today? Because I wasn't sure what to expect this morning. But mm -hmm. as soon as the court got on the, uh, the recording, they said, well, that's off the table. We're not talking about the discovery rule. And I, I was a little surprised. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I can't talk to the internal conversations. But, you know, the, it, it, especially it, it's, I think it's apparent of the, the narrowing is, is apparent. I mean, it's self-evident. But it's also apparent if you look at the cert stage briefing, yeah. right? You look at um, what the cert petition was for. And, you know, I, th I think petitioner, it was toward the end or in a footnote, they said, and by the way, you could also address the discovery rule here if you want to. And then respondent, um, their response was like, said, no, you, you shouldn't deal with that. And then the court issued a narrowed QP that they reformulated. And when you put that all in context, it just seems fairly clear that they, I mean, whether they meant to or not, the, 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 the question is assuming the existence of a discovery rule. Mm -hmm. um, and you know it'll be interesting to see what the court does with that because you saw some of this this morning. But I think some of that was also driven by by the merit stage briefing, and I think that's because if there's a discovery rule, petitioner's arguments are are not so strong. Their strongest argument is that there isn't a discovery rule. So that's mm -hmm. that was the that was their main premise, and that's what they led with. And I think that's kind of what um, is maybe is is broadening this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Todd. Tyler, do you want to weigh in? So uh, they spent a lot of time on the question of what was the question presented? Is it fair to go ahead? Should we dismiss cert as improvidently granted? Um, I, I, as I listen to the argument, it seems to me that 
Justices uh, Jackson and Sotomayor uh, are very much in favor of deciding the case as presented on the assumption that the discovery rule applies. Uh, and Justices uh, uh, Alito and Gorsuch are very much in favor of deciding the antecedent question. It really doesn't make much sense to say, okay, if the discovery rule applies, here's the scope, and then, but we haven't decided whether the discovery rule applies. There isn't any circuit split on that issue, but there's definitely some, uh, some justices who are out to decide that question, right? They, they really want to get to the question of whether there's a discovery rule. So I, I would be surprised if the court dismissed cert as improvidently granted, uh, if they thought there was some sort of unfair surprise here, uh, what you could do is grant cert in Martinelli, uh, hold this case over for re-argument, argue them together in the next term. Um, I could see that making a sort of certain amount of sense, uh, although it means this case is going to be pending for a very long time. Um, but I think uh, they had a point. Both briefs really did discuss the issue of whether a discovery rule applies, even as they tried to emphasize, even as one side tried to emphasize, well, that's not part of the question presented. You know, it would be foolish of you not to present some arguments that, yes, the discovery rule makes sense here. To me, the thing that makes the best argument in favor of the discovery rule is all of the circuits have been using it. Uh, all of the litigants and copyright cases are really used to it. And you could just fix this one problem with the Second Circuit case in Soam, which nobody seems to support. I think there's unanimous Supreme Court decision that Soam is wrong on its reasoning. Um, you could just fix that one problem, go back to the discovery rule, and everyone would be happy. But it's quite clear to me that some of the justices really want to reach out and ask the question, should the discovery rule apply as a textual matter uh, instead of relying on this consensus that's in the Court of Appeals. So um, in particular, Justice Barrett asked a question about, um, you know, I can't remember how she phrased it, but, you know, how, how, how would that look um, if we answered the question in this case that assumes there's a discovery rule, would that appear that the Supreme Court has weighed in or decided the question of whether the discovery rule is appropriate or not? And clearly, you know, that, that's a look thing, right? That's not, um, if the court doesn't just say anything about, they can very clearly set the discovery rule um, aside. But I thought it was, I thought it was interesting and probably honest about um, that calculation of whether to decide the case um, if the court, if, if there is not a majority that would like to decide the discovery rule, um, whether to decide the case or to or to dismiss it. Um, I wonder if anyone has thought has thoughts on that. Well, it's interesting because they granted cert to address a conflict um, of authority or split of authority, and then it shifted to an error of the law where there's basically a everyone agrees at right. the the circuit court level. Which is why I think they rewrote the question because there was they wanted to address the conflict. Um, but of course, when the Supreme Court rules on something, and this is illustrated by the fact that Petrella was discussed so much today, even though Petrella was more of a of a separate accrual case than a discovery case, um, you know, when they rule on something, litigators are going to comb through that and take any language they can to support their their position. So that was a moment of real candor, I, I thought as well, mm -hmm. on the bench today. Mm -hmm. The court is going to have to be very careful if it decides this uh, issue without getting into the injury rule, because the Petrella case is a perfect example. They said a few things that if you rip them out of context, mm -hmm. make pretty clear that you can only get damages for three years after mm -hmm. the infringement. Now, you can't take that statement out of context, but every word to Scott's point that they write in this decision is going to be used by one side or the other to mm -hmm. say that the Supreme Court implicitly is in favor of the injury rule or the discovery rule. Mm -hmm. So um, we could potentially have a narrow decision that is written really narrowly if they go ahead and decide the question presented that they wrote. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, what I'm hoping for is that they hold it over and then they decide to take on the Martinelli case. Uh, like I said at the outset of this, I'd want to know whether or not they really think there is a discovery rule. Uh, 
the Martinelli case it seems like it was almost custom made to tee up that issue. The parties stipulated to basically all the facts that you would need to know to figure out whether or not the discovery rule applied. It's clear that the infringement occurred more than three years after the complaint was filed. The party stipulated that the plaintiff could not have known reasonably about the infringement until within the three-year period. So there's really, the facts are there. It's just a question of whether or not they're going to take that issue up, especially when there is no circuit split. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The only problem with that though, is then some continues to live in the second circuit when everyone agrees that it's probably wrong Yeah, and litigants have to deal with that for you know, a period of time. That is so, fair. And that was the point respondent made. I think he was directly asked that, yeah. that question, what the problem is it's forum shopping, especially mm -hmm. in, in copyright land when the split is uh, between New York and LA and Miami, you know, it makes yeah. a difference. Yeah. <laughs> Right, yeah, if you're a, an but artist in New York, right? Yeah, 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 in New York, you're basically, you know, the denied rights you'd have if you were lucky enough to live in LA. Yeah. I'd say lucky only because of the weather, but, you know. <laughs> so am I right that in the in the uh, cert petition in Martinelli, they even said you could take this case up with um, uh, the, the Warner Chapel definitely case? said that at least in their reply brief. I, okay, I know in the reply brief, okay, yeah. okay. Um, because... Um, you know, that's a lot of background noise, right? So that, I mean, the fact of a, another case that has filed a cert petition weirdly might play a role in the way the Supreme Court decides this case, which is kind of an unusual thing. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and just to put my conspiracy theorist hat on, um, you know, kind of setting up a circuit split taking away a circuit split, reformulating a question, that's not the question. And we've got this case in the, in the wings. <laughs> it, it, it sets up a, a grant of cert in the Martinelli case, where as, as many of you have already said, if there's no circuit split on the discovery rule, it's hard to imagine the court uh, taking that case. I was thinking about that same thing because it is, there's always a conversation about whether a case is a good vehicle, right? That often comes up in the context of, of digging a case or mm -hmm. dismissing it as improvidently granted. But to have Martinelli come up multiple times during the case, when you also have this reframed question and you also have briefing that addresses really Martinelli's situation, not the Neely situation, it, it stood out for that reason. That was unorthodox. I just want to, make sure I'm inviting my uh, online guests to participate. Yeah, okay. Um, so um, the, other, the other thing that I thought was a little bit interesting in this case is, um, so nobody was much interested in the question of this case, right? That, that wasn't really, not, it was an uninteresting uh, topic of conversation. Um, but there's so much interest in overturning Psalm. Um, you know, why, why did the court even take this case in the first place? I mean, it's, it almost seems like a, a, a way of getting to another case that, that it didn't take. Well, I think that they saw the circuit split and they generally want to resolve those. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only after the briefing was submitted that they I reviewed the briefing and said, well, you know, the uh, appellants have basically abandoned some abandoned the Second Circuit's reasoning. And because they made the arguments about the discovery rule in general, mm -hmm. then of course the respondents had to respond and the amicus had to weigh in on it. And so I think that's why that started to take over the mm -hmm. conversation. Um, but uh, you know, the way that the oral argument progressed today, you, you could tell they were trying to focus back in on the actual question of whether or not there's a temporal damages bar here. But because the, the appellant was driving toward a different goal, it never quite got to the actual you know, the situation with Neely's damages. Well, I, I have um, one question about this case, and that is, so it seems like there are three roads the court could take, right? The court could address the question presented, and it seems like the answer is that damages are not um, limited, um, but just the time of, of bringing the claim is limited. Um, the court could um, dismiss the case as improvidently granted, um, or the court could consider, and I think you say this, Tyler, in, in your amicus brief, the court could consider that the discovery rule is before it as a sub-issue um, to the question presented. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering what, what you think uh, will happen. 
And I guess, uh, Tyler, you laid out a fourth position, which is they could hold the case. We're still going to decide this case. Don't worry, litigants. We're just going to really decide the other case. I, I can start on that. If I, I mean, I think I agree that to me, the most likely result is the hold the case for Martinelli. I think that's the most likely scenario. I think dismissing a case because cert was improvidently granted seems a little unlikely to me, but I suppose that's possible here. Um, I, it is interesting to me, and I'm, Professor Ochoa may disagree with this because he's got <clears throat> quite a bit of expertise in this, but you know the, the question about the discovery rule, while all 11 circuits have endorsed it, there's been very little real analysis or any analysis anywhere near what Judge Kaplan in the Southern District did in the in the Augsburg case, where he really went back and looked at the historical antecedents of the use of the words and the history of discovery rules. So, you know, even though there's no circuit split, the Supreme Court may feel that the 11 circuits are all wrong. And there certainly are cases, it's a little unusual because we talk so much about circuit splits, but there's certainly cases where there's no circuit split, there's just a wrong decision by a single circuit and the court has to reverse it. So I'm not sure the court is gonna stay away from this just because there, there's unanimity among circuits. I, I do think that it's very likely the Supreme Court will grant certain Martinelli. Whether they go ahead and decide the discovery rule now or wait until next year um, is a little unclear. It does leave some sort of hanging in the wind um, I could imagine a very short per curiam decision saying, well, if the discovery rule applies, here's how it applies, uh, but don't read anything into that because we've granted cert in this other case. Uh, that's, that's vaguely possible, certainly from a standpoint of sort of orderly procedure. Uh, it's hard for anyone to cry that things were unfair if they hold this over for another term and say, you know, you can submit a supplemental brief on the main question. Uh, I don't, if the court thought that the discovery rule applied, there's no reason not to decide this case now. The only reason not to decide it now is uh, that some of them don't think the discovery rule should apply. And it's kind of silly to pronounce on the scope of the discovery rule if you don't think the discovery rule exists. It's quite clear to me that uh, Justice Thomas, Justice Alito, Justice Gorsuch are ready to say there's no discovery rule here. Uh, it sounded to me from the argument like uh, Sotomayor and Jackson were ready to decide this issue now and don't want to get to the discovery rule. Um, that leaves uh, our, the justices in between. Uh, and Chief Justice Robert and Kavanaugh seemed skeptical of not going ahead and deciding the question now. Justice Barrett was a little more equivocal. Uh, and I don't think Justice Kagan is, is a sure bet to, to go with Sotomayor and Jackson on this one. So, uh, you know, you've, you've got those four justices in the middle and that's where the uncertainty lies. Um, and if you can, if the three conservatives can pick up two of those votes, they may just go ahead and decide the case now. Um, but if, you know, sort of orderly procedure prevails, then I, I agree with Ed, they should wait and grant certain martinality and, and decide the whole thing uh, early next term. Any other predictions? I don't think they're going to decide the injury versus discovery rule right now. Um, first of all, they haven't had the benefit of the government's position, which I think is important mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. to the court. Um, they could grant certain Martinelli and hold over, get the benefit of the government's thoughts on the discovery rule, and then decide then. I, I don't know why there would be a need to rush into making that decision when the government hasn't chimed in yet. Mm -hmm. So that's my prediction. Yeah, and to provide guidance to the lower courts and litigants, I think a short decision that addresses whether or not some is good law and most likely strikes it down would be the best approach. And then they'd have a clean deck to address the, you know, the issue in another subsequent mm -hmm. appeal. Um, and, and I'm not going to, Jason, ask you, what is the government's position <laughs> yeah. on the discovery rule? But that's basically what happened. The government's so position is that the government does not have a position. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, we just have a, a few minutes left before I want to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, but I guess we should take this minute to talk about the discovery rule. And in particular, my question is, 
Is it a policy that makes sense, particularly in copyright? I uh, we covered this to a great degree in our brief because we deal with you know artists and folks bringing claims all the time, and it it doesn't make sense in a in a copyright context because unlike other types of tort, and of course copyright is it's a business tort. You know when you get bit by a dog, you know the day you've been bit by a dog. But when copyright infringement happens, you don't know, right? It could be, and I think we use this example in our brief. Uh, you know, I'm a musician, and someone downloads my beat from the internet, and they start uh, making a copy of it. Under uh, 106 of the Copyright Act, Section 106, those give me my exclusive rights. And the day that those are violated, the copyright infringement occurs. So a lot of the time, infringement occurs in private. It's not common where people are going to lie. It happens, but it's not common where people live stream themselves, copying your music, and then illegally reproducing it. Um, so you know, if you look at it that way, where the infringement starts in private, it can go on for an extended period of time in private. And then even when the infringing work is released to the public, it's very difficult to discover right away. I think we cite statistics, you know, hundreds of thousands of songs are uploaded every day, for example. So it's not uncommon for a, an artist to discover the infringement four or five years down the road. And it seems unfair, and it doesn't seem in line with the Copyright Act's intent or tax to say, well, you're out of luck if you didn't, if you didn't discover it within three years. And it also doesn't seem in line with the text and intent of the Copyright Act to reward an infringer for concealing the infringement, right? Maybe I'm a savvy infringer and I, I try not to, put the infringing work on certain platforms because I know those are more public. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at it at it that way, the infringement starts as soon as the illegal reproduction is made. And if you look at the incentives behind the act, it seems like the discovery rule just doesn't make sense in a copyright case. And there are other examples of discovery rules applying. And it is cases like medical malpractice or other situations where you don't necessarily know of the injury until later on. Mm -hmm. Any other so I, I, I agree with what you said um, as far as it goes. But what you see in the lower courts is that they're applying a, the discovery rule very differently in cases involving ownership disputes than they are in cases involving ordinary infringement, right? So where there's an ownership dispute as to whether this party owns the copyright or that party owns the copyright, what they're saying is that you've got to sue within three years of when you find out that there's a dispute. Right. When the other party has expressly repudiated your co-ownership, you've got to sue within three years. And if you don't sue within three years, then you are stuck for the entire rest of the term of the copyright. That, you know, even though the copyright might last for another half a century or more, that if you don't bring your ownership dispute right away, you are forever barred. And uh, a Sixth Circuit judge has taken that on. Uh, uh, Circuit Judge Murphy in the Sixth Circuit has written two concurring opinions where he says, well, that just doesn't make sense. Ownership isn't a claim. Ownership is an element of a claim. And in, it's inconsistent with Petrella because in Petrella they said, well, you're never barred by latches. You can all, if, if infringements are ongoing, you can always sue at least for the last three years of damages. The same thing should be true even if ownership is a disputed element of the claim. Uh, and I, I have to agree with that. It's bothered me for a long time that they said, you know, well, you might have been a, an, uh, the owner of this copyright, but if you didn't raise that in a timely manner, you're forever barred from raising that. Uh, it seems to me that if, if Petrella is correct, right, and there was some, a lot of dispute about that, uh, but if Petrella is correct, that you should be able to sue at any time and get three years worth of damages because each act of infringement starts a new three-year period of running, then that would suggest you don't have to bring ownership claims up immediately. You can wait and bring your ownership claim up at a later time, and you're not barred from, by latches from doing so. Uh, so... I, you know, I have a real problem with the way the lower courts have been applying the discovery rule in cases involving ownership disputes. That's different from how they've been applying it in cases where ownership is clear and only infringement is involved. Yeah, I agree. And I think that raises two important questions. The first is this distinction between um, ownership claims and infringement claims. There really is no distinction because every infringement claim has an ownership element. It's one of the two things that you have to prove, ownership and copying. And so the distinction that's been 
court created basically between ownership claims and infringement claims and how the statute of limitations should apply to both is itself, I think, law that should be addressed because I don't think there is a distinction. Certainly the statute doesn't have it. But even in the courts that have applied that, that distinction, it runs not from, you know, accrual in those cases runs from repudiation. And a repudiation in that, in that context is notice. Did one owner tell the other owner, you're not the owner, I am. And that's notice, right? So the way that that's being applied in a context where it probably shouldn't be because there's no distinction, I think lends more credence to the fact that it is a, it's a, a notice or injury or, I'm sorry, a notice or discovery type, uh, type structure that, that the, the courts are looking at. So what I'm hearing is we had the Petrella case about statute of limitations and latches. And now we have this case, which may or may not decide if the discovery rule applies, how far back can you get damages? Um, we're probably gonna have the Martinelli case, which is going to decide whether or not we have the discovery rule, but still lingering there will be another question about um, dealing with this ownership question and how to measure the statute of limitations with regard to ownership. So this seems like a topic y'all should be writing your notes and comments about. Um, I, so I should point out though, that this case uh, is an ownership case. Warner Chapter versus Neely is an ownership case. Right. So that would counsel for the Supreme Court holding it over and deciding it at the same time with Martinelli. And to make matters a little more, I believe it's an ownership case because the party stipulated to it, not because the court found it to be the. So it is, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues with the with the vehicle. Um, unless there are any remaining thoughts, I'll throw it open to the um, to the uh, audience. Uh, Ned, Jason. Well, Kevin, I mean, yeah. just to play devil's advocate for a second yeah. on, does it make sense to have a statute of limitations of three years without a discovery rule? I mean, it is true that some kid in his basement may be making a copy of a song or a beat. Uh, I don't think that, you know, those are the infringements that we need to be particularly worried about. Like, that those aren't ever going to get discovered. You're never going to bring that claim. Mm -hmm. The ones that matter are the ones that become the big songs. When they're a big song, the copyright owner should be on notice. And they should bring the claim within three years. I think three years is plenty of time to get a case together and file it. Um, and it, you know, it's always the case that some bona fide claims go uncompensated under the statute of limitations. And the reason we do that is because we want certainty. Mm -hmm. And if you have a discovery rule, you almost by definition never really have any certainty because you won't know when the copyright owner will necessarily be aware or reasonably should have been aware of the infringement. So I think there is a benefit to having a statute of limitations. I think the AAP in their brief even referenced the idea of having to track down licenses from 20 years ago to figure out, did we exceed the scope of that license or not? So, you know, maybe three years should be longer, if, but uh, I think there should be some definitive rule where a, a party can know that they're now free for infringement claims. Yeah, just to add one thing to that, because I, I didn't want to get into a debate over too much over injury versus discovery. But I think most people agree that there can be some sort of concept of equitable tolling, that if, as Scott mentioned, if a defendant is hiding the ball, that there might be situations where the, the court would say, even under the injury rule, that there was a toll of the statute of limitations. Uh, my final point will be that I think we can all agree this is the most important case the Supreme Court has. This <laughs> <laughs> if they continue to have it. Uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, and with that, um, I'd like to invite questions from the audience. Uh, Jane. So apart from what Kevin noted earlier about not having the benefit of the government's position on the discovery rule, is there anything else that the court is really missing in this case to decide the discovery rule? It doesn't seem, even though Martinelli is teed up in a very clean way, it seems like they don't have split there. So maybe they would not want to start granting things just for the hell of it. They're worried about decorum. Is there anything that they're missing factually that would prevent them from just deciding it because they want to? I, 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 want, I want the panelists to answer the question specifically because you said factually, but um, this did come up a little bit in oral argument where you know there was some debate about whether this was or was not briefed, right? Because yeah. you know people kind of were on notice that they shouldn't brief it, and yet it did sneak into a lot of the briefs. So. Yeah, and 
I think that the court doesn't want to encourage folks appearing before it to include things in their brief just to get the other side to respond and then be able to come into court and say, hey, they engage with the issue. It's now before the court. All right. So I can see that being something, you know, a reason why they wouldn't want to grapple with with the discovery rule. Um, but, you know, to your point about there being no circuit split, you know, I'm not as convinced they're going to pick up Martinelli for that reason that you have a lot of cases that are of great importance in creating a dispute where there really isn't one, where the court's been applying the discovery rule for decades, you know, in, in with basic harmony, other than this original ownership infringement distinction. Yeah, you know, I, I would be surprised if they went any far, um, further than just looking at the Psalm conflict and resolving it. I would say I would say that they could decide it now. They certainly have the power to decide it now. Um, the decorum is probably the best reason to hold it over and wait for for Martinelli. Uh, and then nobody can complain that the court wasn't playing fair if they do that. Um, but I think they have all of the tools necessary to decide it now. And I'm quite convinced that a couple of the justices are on a crusade against the discovery rule. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if they, uh, I mean, the question is whether or not they can convince enough of their colleagues to go ahead and decide it now. Can I just, can I just ask a follow-up question? Um, the timing of deciding where the votes are in this case, and deciding where the votes are in the granting cert in the Martinelli case. Um, it seems like those bear on one another, right? Or they may. I think that the Martinelli case was in conference this past week. So they should have been pretty read up on this case while they were talking about the Martinelli case. And you know, I don't know what, they haven't decided obviously whether or not they're granting cert yet. Uh, it will be interesting to see if we get a decision on that front in the very near future. So we'll probably hear about that first, and we might consider those tea leaves to read. I think that's possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the timing was really interesting between Martinelli being in conference, and then yesterday there was a case dealing with statute of limitations right. and accrual as well. So it's almost you know statute of limitations week at the yeah. Supreme Court. All right. Uh, any other questions? We'll take one more. Isaac. Um, so I know that in, especially in art law, um, but in property law in general, in some states, there's an idea of, with adverse possession, a uh, sort of demand in writing to give it back. That's when the statute of limitations begins, is when the true owner demand, or true owner's not the best way to put it, but when you demand that the uh, chattel is given back or the property is given back to you, that's when the statute of limits begins. Uh, sort of on both sides, why do you think that this either would or would not sort of be beneficial in a copyright scenario? Or because especially, especially if it's in an ownership dispute, it's not that far off, at least in my mind, from a adverse possession dispute. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. It really illuminates why the ownership versus infringement case, it, the distinction should be without a difference. Because I could send a demand letter to Paul McCartney and say, I own you know, all the Beatles albums. And if he doesn't sue me in three years, I can then move forward with that copyright. It, it, it's really sort of nonsensical when you consider it that way. If repudiation is going to set a, a time bar three years from the date of repudiation, if they don't sue you, and there's really no other requirements, it, it, it of course shouldn't be the law. It makes no sense. And that's one of the reasons why this ownership Versus infringement claim distinction also is nonsensical. Okay. Well, with that, I would like to invite you to uh, join me in thanking our wonderful speakers for enlightening us on this case. And I would like to invite the people who are here to join us outside for a reception. Sorry, Tyler and Ned, <laughs> an Cute. online audience. <laughs> Thank you guys, that was really wonderful. Thanks so much for joining me.